app that is Valentine's Day today. So uh, what happens in, uh, as in love, as in retinal imaging, you have to read very carefully between the lines. So uh, what I have to say is that retinal imaging is a whole new ball game, so you can fall in love with it with our wonderful panel consisting of uh, Dr. Manoj, Dr. Shane, Dr. Me uh, Anand, uh, Dr. Darius, and Dr. Ashish. <coughs> uh, we'll be going through some of the modalities uh, in uh, detail to see how it affects uh, 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 clinical uh, diagnosis and management. Uh, some, we've got some good, uh, wonderful talks here, and we're proud to be associated again with AIOC uh, 2020. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'd like to, we can start off with the first talk by uh, Dr. Manoj. Good morning. Uh, I'll be talking to you on uh, multicolor imaging of the fundus. So, multicolor uh, fundus imaging is an innovative uh, imaging technology that's part of the Spectralis uh, multimodal imaging platform. So basically this uh, involves uh, using lasers to photograph the retinal fundus. So it uses three laser colors, uh, the blue, green, and the infrared uh, laser that penetrates the tissue at different depths and simultaneously uh, captures and depicts information originating from the different retinal structures. And this is different from the conventional flash fundus photography which uses light. Now that the advantage is that um, these lasers, you now they capture uh, um, information from different structures like the red laser. The infrared uh, laser uh, captures information from the outer retina and the choroid. The green laser obtains information from the middle retinal layers, including the retinal blood vessels. And the blue laser obtains information from the superficial retinal structures, including the nerve fiber layer. Now you get three uh, monochromatic images, and these are superimposed, and you get a composite image. And this is what we call as a multicolor image, which is uh, in fact a pseudo color image. Now, multicolor imaging is better than fundus um, uh, flash photography because, um, uh, because this uh, platform uses the confocal technology, and therefore the images have a better contrast and sharper borders, and uh, it's also possible to obtain good quality images in hazy media and in small people, so that's a big advantage. The image is better. Patient comfort is also better because it does not use bright white light and it's thus not discomforting to the patient. Again, patients requiring OCTs can be imaged in the same machine and need not be shifted. So the superiority of multicolor imaging uh, has been reported in various retinal conditions, and it is not just another uh, fancy tool. Now let us see a few examples where uh, this is useful. Now this is a patient dry AMD, and dry AMD is particularly useful. In dry AMD, multicolor imaging helps us to identify not only the drusens, but also you can see these green dots here. This represents the retinal pseudodrusens, which is now very evident in the autofluorescence photograph. Now this is yet another example of a patient with uh, retinal pseudodrusin. You can see here, this is the greenish dots which represent the retinal pseudodrusin. And um, as against the uh, typical drusin, which is sub uh, retinal pigment epithelium, this is at the le uh, level above the retinal pigment epithelium as you can see in the OCTs here. So nowadays this is also called a sub-retinal drusinoid deposit. Now uh, studies have also shown that multicolor uh, imaging has higher sensitivity than the routine fundus photography for de detection of early AMD features, be it soft drusens or reticular drusens, atrophy or fibrosis. And um, studies have also shown that there is a good correlation between multicolor images and fundus autofluorescence, which is the gold standard for uh, follow following of patients with the dry AMD, especially patients with geographic atrophy. Now, sometimes multicolor may be even better than um, fundus autofluorescence. As you can see in this image here, this is a unilateral one-eyed patient who has relatively good vision. If you look at the autofluorescence, it looks bad because there's a lot of fo uh, foveal involvement. But you can see the fovea being spared very clearly on the, on the, on the multicolor imaging. That can explain why this patient has got reasonably good vision. Now, consider this example. This is a patient now who had this kind of a macular lesion here on the multicolor image. You can see here on the infrared channels, uh, this, is, this is very evident, but on the blue and, red, uh, blue and green channels, this is not obvious. So this is 
basically a disease of the outer retina. You can see the auto fluorescence, which does not give you much clue as to what is happening. And OCT here shows PACI results. So PACI choroid disease, um, especially when, when there's overlying epitheliopathy, can, can manifest very, uh, very evidently on the multicolor image. This is another example of a patient here, again a one-eyed patient here. You can see an abnormal network of vessels on the multicolor image. On the OCT, there's no sign of active CNEM. You just see a shallow um, elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium with a, with a uh, double layer sign there. Uh, and uh, if you, when, we, when we did an, uh, an octa, the octa picked up a neoascular membrane in the chorea capillary layer. So this is what is uh, now called as a non-exudative CNVM. So these things can be actually picked up on the multicolor image. Now in, in patients with diabetic retinopathy, multicolor imaging is very useful to pick up even the uh, very subtle abnormalities and especially the green channels can pick up uh, the, the red dot hemorrhages very evidently, but it's more useful in patients with macular edema because of, uh, in, in a, on a normal color fundus photography, you, you cannot, um, is, is, you don't get a 3D dimension of the macular edema. But here no, on the multicolor image, the, the area of macular edema has this greenish tinge. So you know that this is the extent of macular edema. And also, when, when you have cystoid changes, you, it appears as a, uh, uh, with a reddish hue, which, which may not be evident on a routine um, fundus photography. And this is a patient with proliferative disease that you can see, see this is a thickened posterior hyaloid, um, which is very evident and which is uh, on the multicolor, but not seen uh, very clearly on the on the clinical and the routine flash-based photography. Now, some other macular conditions. This is a patient uh, uh, who has an apparently normal-looking macula, but if you take the multicolor image, you can see this lesion here in the right eye, and also you can see this area of fluid pocket in the left eye. Uh, so this is um, a patient with pigment epithelial detachment in, in the right eye and uh, a central serous chorioretinopathy in the, in the left eye. Now, multicolor imaging helps us not only to understand the extent of the fluid, it also picks up um, the RP abnormality, and sometimes it can mirror changes as uh, what we see on, on uh, ICG angiography. Like in this patient, you have these um, hyperpermeable choroidal foci, which corresponds to this orangish appearance on the, on the multicolor image. So it, it gives us um, a lot of information than, than, uh, than color fundus photography. Yet another example of a patient with a macular lesion, apparently normal looking macula, but on the multicolor you can see this perifoveal um, altered reflectivity. Now this is a patient with IJT, parafoveal telangiectasia, and on the OCT you see it seems to correspond to the areas of um, the photoreceptor loss. Uh, this is a patient with proliferative macular where you can see very clearly the, uh, an abnormal network that we're seeing um, on the multicolor image. And this patient had on the OCT angiogram um, invasion of the deep capillary plexus into the avascular layer. So this is um, an early proliferative um, uh, macular that is picked up very clearly on a fundus, uh, multicolor image. And it's very, very useful in surface disorders uh, because um, the epiretal membranes, the very faint ones, may be easily missed on a clinical fundus photography. But because of this greenish tinge, you can see this, um, the, these epiretal uh, membranes very clearly. Uh, you can also see the extent of fraction it exerts on the underlying retina. All these folds can be very clearly seen on the multicolor image. Now it's, it's a very useful tool preoperatively because um, when you have globally uh, um, adherent retinal epiretal membranes, it helps us you know, to decide you know, where to start your peeling. Now this is an area where you, can, you could start peeling. It's also useful in glaucoma where um, it can pick up nerve fiber layer defects as you can see in this uh, picture. Now this is a patient with macular hole surgery who had a successful uh, macular hole closure, but then he had a lot of metamorphopsia and, and really unhappy with the quality of vision that he had. And this is the multicolor image. You now you can see this here. This is the, the um, nerve fiber layer defects that, that, that can happen with, um, with, mac, with IM in, uh, ILM peeling uh, and aggressive ILM peeling. And also in this picture, you can make out the margins of the peeled ILM. So no, I don't think any other imaging modality can pick this up so evidently. This may be uh, speci specifically useful when you have situations where you need to repeal membranes when you have a poor um, our surgical outcome. In disorders of disc also multicolor imaging is useful. Now this is a patient with uh, pseudo disc edema and this is a patient with the true disc edema. You can see this greenish tinge around the, the, the peripapillary area and this can help you to differentiate between a true disc edema from a pseudo disc edema. Um, now, it, multicolor imaging is very useful in follow, following up patients with nevus, 
because uh, I believe that this is the best investigation to to exactly uh, to, to to study the extent of the universe. You can directly measure. You see the color contrast photography where it's not the margins are not very evident, and when you need to follow up these patients, multicolor imaging is the best imaging tool. It's also helpful in, in osteomas. It helps us to differentiate between uh, calcific and the decalcific osteomas. You see the change in color, the greenish tinge and the reddish tinge. And um, uh, lastly, multicolor imaging also helps us to see a lot of unseen things. Like this is a patient, a uh, diabetic patient with asteroid hylosis, uh, where there's no good view of the fundus. If you take a multicolor image, you can see um, these, these uh, hemorrhages. So you know that we are dealing with a patient who has diabetic retinopathy. This is yet another example here. It shows proliferative disease, also with macular edema and uh, some ILM folds, uh, suggestive of a epidural membrane. This is a patient who was uh, posted for cataract surgery. This is the color of photo, 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 photography. And here, the multicolor image, you can see this area of, you know, the greenish tinge, which again indicates there is some fluid collection there. Also, you can see an epidural membrane here. So all this information is much more evident on a multicolor image when compared to uh, conventional photography. One should be aware of um, artifacts when you take multicolor imaging. The most common artifact is this, this central spot artifacts. This happens uh, usually with uh, wide field images and in, um, and in those uh, eyes which have cataract and, and pseudophagic eyes. And also, you should uh, understand that this, the interpretation of colors is very tricky. So you see this, uh, the colors are different. Na edemas appear greenish, and uh, some of the drusens appear orangish, some drusens appear greenish. And the most important thing is some of these hemorrhages, the, the pigments may appear reddish in color, and you should not mistake, in, uh, mistake it for hemorrhages. Uh, so to conclude, it's a dynamic fundus photography. It helps in better visualization and understanding of the structural details of the retina and the toroid, and is on its way to replace conventional fundus uh, uh, photography. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manoj, and uh, that was a nice talk on multicolor. Uh, we can have a small discussion of a couple of, uh, just maybe a minute. And uh, I just want to start off the discussion by asking, uh, in the cur current scenario, would you prefer multicolor in all macular pathologies nowadays? No, at least in, in, uh, in AMDs. In AMDs, definitely uh, all uh, patients with dry AMDs, uh, uh, I think uh, this is an important modality because um, Little pseudo drusen is an important uh, finding that we uh, often fail to, to recognize. So it's an important uh, investigation to do in dry AMD patients. And, uh, in, and the other situation is when, when you have um, an, 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 an unexplained um, visual loss and you, and you look at the fundus and then you don't see um, anything spectacular on the fundus. That's, it's a good idea to do, uh, instead of taking a, a fundus photography, uh, taking a multicolor. So I think these are two situations where definitely, you know, I would uh, think of doing multicolor image. Uh, do we have any questions or? Uh, yeah. No, it adds information to. Uh, so the to question the was, uh, does autofluorescence, uh, does multicolor add to doing autofluorescence in cases of dry AMD? Yeah, it, it adds to. Now, I'm not um, see the thing is here. Um, we are not going to use multicolor imaging as a standalone uh, investigative modality. Now, it adds information to what you uh, know. So uh, definitely, there are indications uh, where you need to do perform a fundus autofluorescence, but this adds to, to the information that you get. But one particular feature that is good in the multicolor is that uh, the attenuation that happens because of the lens on autofluorescence is slightly spared when you do a multicolor imaging. So when you add the two information together, you get additional borders, additional mar margins, color differences that can probably in the future we can actually be talking about uh, the progressive edge of the geographic atrophy or something using multicolor later. Any, t any tips for that artifact? Uh, because that's something which really bothers us in our clinic. Right? No, but uh, this happens mostly with a, with a wide field uh, images. Now, if you look at the central uh, three-degree images, no, you, ca you can. Uh, actually, with, uh, um, if you take paints a little bit focusing, mm -hmm. you can actually avoid those artifacts. Do you also put a lubricant drop or some, yes, some people yes. and, and then yes, it helps. He lights in the room too, so that? Putting, uh, adding a lubricant definitely helps, you know. And uh, this again happens in eyes uh, which has uh, cataract also. So, I mean, in these situations, you, know, you have to keep this in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Ghost, yeah. Yeah, it looks like uh, it's, it, it's yeah, troubled us a lot. I think this tip Dr. Unni gave us, the, the white, just take a smaller, because I think for his Congress, I got some really terrible images from our system, and his were fabulous. So, so I think that also helps what you said. 
if you so have a macular pathology, focus on the macular. Focus on the, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Shane, Manoj, uh, Dr. Shane, to give us uh, uh, something about infrared reflectance. It's a modality that is coming into a lot of vogue by the different channels of light that are coming in. But infrared reflectance, NIR, is uh, is quite useful. So, Dr. Shane, please. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Uh, infrared. Why we use infrared? Because infrared has got a longer wavelength and uh, it. Uh, surpasses media opacity. So infrared has been used as a source of imaging in uh, all walks of science. Uh, in, for example, uh, people with uh, food and drug administration, they actually check for the quality of canned food with uh, infrared imaging. So is uh, in the other fields of medicine where they scan the parotid gland to see for cancerous growth. So it has been there all around. And in fundus also, infrared imaging has got its own role. role. And in the next 10 minutes, let's see uh, what is the main role. So I would like to divide my talk into four important points, the general principle regarding the same, few clinical examples on how it complements multimodal imaging, and what is new in uh, red uh, reflectance imaging and the present role. So what is infrared reflectance? We throw an infrared light onto the retina and the light which is reflected back is captured and that is infrared reflectance. It reaches the RP and choroid, so deeper structures are seen clearly. So what is autofluorescent imaging? Here we utilize the fluorescent uh, capability of the retina or the RP and the choroid. And we have two types of autofluorescence. One is a blue autofluorescence, and the other one is a red autofluorescence. We use blue light for autofluorescence, and we use red light for autofluorescence. When we use blue light, it is the lipofusin that fluoresces, and when you use in near infrared light or a red autofluorescence, it is the melanin of the RP and to some extent of the choroid that fluoresces. So, how to differentiate between an infrared image and an autofluorescent image? The main difference is the autofluorescent image will have dark disc and vessels because there is no lipofusin in them. But the infrared reflectance shows reasonably well good character of the disc and vessels. Now the RP uh, anatomy is clearly made out, which is not so clearly made out in an autofluorescent image. So this is a normal red autofluorescent image and this is a normal blue autofluorescent image. So let's see what is the difference. In a red autofluorescent image, I said melanin is the fluorophore, so the fovea is bright because there is a lot of melanin here. Whereas in blue autofluorescent, lipofusin is the fluorophore and the fovea does not have lipofusin because it is metabolically very active and the RP mechanism is also very strong. So there's no lipofusin here, so the fovea is dark. So this is our uh, normal uh, Heidelberg uh, printout where you can actually get a red autofluorescence as well as a red reflectance image. Probably these are some things which we underutilize in our practice. It is there in the machine, all you have to do is utilize it. So in the couple of few exams, I'm gonna show you why this is important. So better visualization in the presence of media opacities. This patient has the central subfoveal RP atrophy, which is not seen on conventional photography because of the presence of cataract, which is so clearly seen after a red reflectance imaging. So most of it is used in dry AMD cases because it clearly could uh, delineate the area of geographic atrophy, better visualization of the drusens, and hence better look for progression of the disease. Red in autofluorescent imaging is supposed to be the best in imaging uh, dry AMD patients because of the fact that the overestimation of atrophy of the foveal area is lessened when we use a near infrared light for autofluorescence. So reticular pseudodrusen, the characteristic reticular pattern with hypo reflective points is seen so clearly with an infrared reflectance image. Most of the retinal dystrophies produce a lot of lipofusin. So uh, blue autofluorescence, autofluorescence is the treatment or the imaging modality of choice, except in cases of certain retinitis pigmentosa. Here, the right side shows a red autofluorescent image, and the left side shows a blue autofluorescent image. The damage of the 
uh, foveal area is seen so clearly in a red autofluorescent image when compared to the blue autofluorescent. So red autofluorescent imaging has got its role, especially in some form of retinitis pigmentosa. There isn't much study on diabetic retinopathy and red reflectance, but a uh, Japanese group found that there is a negative correlation between the central foveal thickness and infrared autofluorescence imaging. Most of the chorioretinal infective and inflammatory diseases, uh, increased autofluorescent signal in cases of active diseases, especially the edges of the active disease is hyperautofluorescent and hypoautofluorescence in the quiescent stage of the disease. Autofluorescence helps us in uh, looking into the progress of treatment in these cases and also to predict which patients will have reactivation on stoppage of immunomodulators. So yet another area uh, of importance of this is in following up of a case of nevus. So this is a choroidal nevus, infrared reflectance as well as red autofluorescence image shows and hyper autofluorescence. Whereas if you take a blue autofluorescent image, a pure nevus will be hypo autofluorescence. So if you see a nevus in a blue autofluorescence, which shows hyper autofluorescence means that there is lipofusion deposition and that means the nevus is probably turning into malignancy. So this is a good modality to check whether a non-invasive modality to check whether the nevus is uh, proceeding to malignancy. Most of the subretinal fluid and the intraretinal fluid is hyporeflective on autofluorescent imaging. So uh, some of the subtle retinal changes are visualized better by infrared imaging. So this is an acute nerve fiber layer edema following ILM peel, following a macular hole surgery, which cannot be uh, or may not be easily seen on direct evaluation. So this patient had a sudden loss of vision in the left eye. Uh, fundus looks reasonably normal, but infrared reflectance shows a hyperreflective centered image corresponding to area of acute macular neuroretinitis. So this buried rusen is well picked up on blue autofluorescent imaging. So that means uh, it reveals the invisible sometimes. Now the Area of retinal pigment epithelial damage is better seen with infrared uh, reflectance or autofluorescence imaging. Here, uh, the epiretinal membrane is so clearly seen on infrared reflectance imaging, but the area of RP hyperplasia is not so seen well. But in case of this autofluorescence imaging, the area of RP hyperplasia is well demarcated. So this patient had a diminution of vision in the right eye and all the only positive finding was a mild hyperfluorescent scene just temporal to the fovea. So MACTL was supposed to be a retinal disease predominantly, but we know that in the early form of the disease, there is transfer of macular pigments towards the macula, thereby giving a hyper autofluorescence on a red autofluorescent imaging. This could be the probably the earliest change you can get in a MACTL. This is again a MACTL, fundus uh, fluorescent angiogram shows areas of leakage, but a corresponding area of uh, red autofluorescence shows increased area of RP damage, which is more than what is seen on FFA. So here, infrared imaging complements FFA in understanding the disease of the patient better. So what is the future of black and white imaging? It is fluorescent lifetime ophthalmic imaging. It is nothing but the average amount of time a fluorophore remains in the excited stage. As age advances, the fluorescent lifetime of the uh, RPE increases, so is with pathology. So advances, advantages is that it's non-invasive and detect pathological changes despite the presence of media opacity and it helps to visualize subretinal features in much more precision. So what are the uses of fundus autofluorescence and infrared reflectance? It's mostly a diagnostic indicator and it helps in monitoring progression of the disease. So the limitations are there are no reference databases available and there are difference in acquisition systems. Some uses confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy while the other uses conventional light. So the take home message is 
I think we should seamlessly integrate fundus autofluorescence and reflectance with other methods to gain a complete understanding of the patient's disease. And in case of overlapping of findings, choose the most non-invasive one. So I think uh, the message I want to convey is don't use uh, this as the single modality of uh, diagnosis, but please combine it with, with other, our usually done OCT, so that you can understand the disease of the patient better and follow them up quite well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shane, for that uh, excellent talk. Uh, are there any queries? We can take a minute or two to answer some questions. Uh, can you just uh, help us a little? How do we treat this acute macular neuroretinitis? I mean, it's wonderful. Like you could diagnose it on this modality. Uh, well, uh, what is the treatment it's a, for this? Uh, it's a, it's a. There are two different uh, pathologic mechanisms involved. One say it could be an ischemic process, or one uh, an inflammatory process. These are the two uh, important theories behind it, and most of them are self-resolving. But then. Uh, in my clinical practice, I give a short course of oral steroids. Steroids, because this could be a viral retina. Viral yeah. Retina. So the two, 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 two etiologies. One is there is an ischemic process happening there. Second is an inflammatory process. It could be either viral or inflammatory. Any of the etiologies. But in an ischemic process, would you have the swelling there? Ischemic process. Um, yes, I, I can take that if yeah, Shane doesn't mind. So. The AMN and the AMN variant called PAM, that is a, uh, the, the acute middle maculopathy, uh, which was first thought to be an AMN variant, and now it is progressing to another disease entity. Essentially, it shows the, uh, the middle layers and uh, with long-term effects of the, uh, of the inner retinal layers. So the indication, the level of involvement, the NFAST scanning picture of the PAMM uh, suggests that that particular patient would require an intensive vascular screen so that is the most important point there. If you see an AMN to differentiate uh, between an ischemic pathology and an inflammatory, the inflammatory is self-resolving, as you said. Yes. But the ischemic pathology, you are probably sitting on a small uh, systemic time bomb over there. Okay. So it is up to you to advise your patients that they require a proper systemic uh, vascular evaluation at that point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I just wanted to add a point to this. Uh, uh, an optical coherence tomography is uh, angiogram. OCT angiogram is very useful to pick this up. Now, because basically they say that uh, in PAM, it's a deep capillary plexus that is involved. So then um, take, uh, taking them in the acute phase does help. And even in the late phases, you know, looking at the NFAS images helps. You know, there are certain patterns described, like a fern pattern that is described, which tells us as to what could be the vascular event. Like uh, following the retinal vein occlusions, um, it's described that you have this kind of uh, fern pattern on the NFAS images. So now the imaging now helps us to understand what uh, is the process behind PAM. Um, now I would like to request a small change in the, in, in the order of the talks. Now I would like to request Dr. Anand Rajendran to give his talk on the real uses of uh, Okta in AMD. Thank you, uh, Manoj and Uni, for having me in this IC. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and to talk to you on the real use of OCT angiography in AMD. Now the three or four musketeers or investigative modalities that serve AMD are uh, FFA and ICG, these are the invasive ones, OCT, and the new kid on the block, OCT angiography, these are non-invasive. <coughs> now the rationale for OCTA, OCT angiography in AMD, uh, we can look at the comparative merits of the uh, investigative modalities available. FFA is a gold standard for diagnosis and classification of CNBMs. This used to be the case, and now with antiviral therapy, that is getting blurred a bit. ICG helps delineate the entire extent of lesion and distinguish it from TCE that really finds its USP. OCD is great for structural imaging of the thickness, fluid compartments, PEDs, and qualitative and quantitative assessment. But it is really OCD angiography where you can pick out these early small neovascular sprouts and the early progenitors are highlighted or delineated very well. Whereas with conventional fluorescent angiographs, these are often concealed by the late phase hyperfluorescence, hinders precise characterization of the vascular features, and of course, there's always the issue of anaphylaxis. So what are the principles of Okta? Okta provides a clear, depth-resolved, dialysis visualization of the retinal and choroidal microvasculature based on principles of motion contrast imaging. RBC movement is mapped over time by comparing sequential OCTD scans at co-registered point locations. Now, there are different uh, uh, algorithms out there, the OMAG, which is very eff uh, effective in the Zeiss machine, optical microangiographies, uh, SSADA, we use the RQ view, splits etc. 
uh, amplitude decorrelation angiography, and then you have F-SADA, which is full spectrum amplitude decorrelation angiography. So octane AMD uh, uh, enjoys the benefits of a good diagnostic, which is a good predictor and a good prognostic, and we'll look at that. So detection of new aspiration AMD and PC is based on boundary-specific segmentation. This is basically different segmentation strategies used based on location of the new aspiration. For example, outer retina to chorea capillaris, or what is become popularly called as ORC slab, detects all macular neovascularization. Outer retina to RPE slab detects your type 2 neovascularization or erstwhile classic CNVS. And RPE to chorea capillaris slab below uh, detects type 1 neovascularization and PCD. So you can see this is the RPE segment, and this is the RPE fit or the group membrane. <coughs> so to optimize visualization of CMV or PCD and minimize projection artifacts, one can either change the thickness of the RP-RP fit slab or can change the position of the RP-RP fit slab. Now, predictive features of uh, using Octa for neovascular AMD, this was given by a very recent, very good article by Choi et al., who looked at type 1 CMV in neovascular AMD and subjected these patients to a loading base of uh, aflibercept and then PR and thereafter. They then segregated the uh, patients into two, those that were stable who required only less than two injections in the follow-up period after loading dose and the unstable patients who required more than three injections. And they looked at quantitative features. And in that, they compared a number, uh, new vessel area, length, density, lacularity, which was a sprouting tendency, Endpoint density, which is the number of open-ended vessels per unit length. Junction density, which is the number of junctions per unit length. And largest ca vessel caliber. And then they used various angio tool based software analytics. And they came up with this big uh, table where they segregated you know, the findings into the stable and the unstable groups. What they did find was that there were two uh, parameters, endpoint density and lacunarity, which was increased in the unstable group with a significant p-value. And they then developed a predictive model based on the endpoint density, which had very high sens sensitivity and specificity. Now, these uh, findings were based on a primer uh, erstwhile articles by Koskas et al., who looked at this initially, and they looked at a large number of patients, 126 AMD, CMV, and IS. And they used Spectralis Heidelberg for the structural OCD and Octa of the TopCon. And they f uh, detected these four OCD angiographic morphological features initially. The tiny branching vessels, which are thin tangled capillaries, followed by vascular loops, which are peripheral connections of these tiny branching vessels. Both these were in the high 80s, followed by peripheral anastomotic uh, arcades, which are inner as anastomosis between these very same tiny vessels, followed by choreo capillaries, hypo intense halos, which are hypo intense zones suggesting choroidal low flow zone. Next. So then they found that the summation of all these four gives the highest predictive value for exudative activity and the need for antiregistic treatment, up, up in the 98%. The most reliable ones were the two ones which are highest, uh, tiny branching vessels and vascular loops, which had the highest correlation with the treatment decision and the highest relative risk of exudation. So these were the tiny branching vessels, peripheral anastomosis arcades. Now, uh, courtesy of Dr. Phil Rosen from my intern, he has been able to use the swept source Plexolite 9000 with a high uh, number of A-scans, 100,000 A-scans per second, and we've been able to really look at the two component, components of the uh, mixed uh, or composites in the MNV. Uh, as some examples here, beautiful examples. And here in, the, in this page, we put up the NPOS OCD followed by the NPOS structure, OCD, OCD slab, and the structural OCD. So you can see various examples where we've been beautifully been able to differentiate the two components. So this is, here you have one where the type 1 MNV is sitting atop the type 2 MNV, another where the type 1 and type 2 are on either side of the MNV. So you, when a CNV is actually refractory, you can actually make out which component is causing that refractoriness and which component is actually melting away. So. Octa is also very useful in RAP lesions, as you can see here. This is Octa of a RAP lesion here, and you can see the magnified Octa, and these actually look better than what you see on the FFA. <coughs> Another case of a RAP, you can follow it post-treatment. You can see that new vascular network just melting away post aflibercept So it's a very good tool uh, for monitoring treatment too. Another case where uh, a RAP lesion, where you can see them in the, in the uh, ox lab, you can see that on Pagangio with the projection artifacts, and then the lower or RP slab, when you bring that slab down, you can see that it's the same thing with a greater detail. But then once you remove these projection artifacts, you can actually see these beautifully highlighted, and you can actually really track that new vascular network going forward. In PCV also, it makes a, uh, it's beginning to you know, show this thing. You can see the polyp in the double layer sign on the OCT, structural OCT. On the ox slab, you can see the N, N pass ONGO, one uh, projection artifact removed, and you can actually see that network quite beautifully. But when you 
to go forward with the RPCC slab, you can actually see it even better with the polyp, with the tangled vessels within that and the branch terrestrial network. And in fact, this looks a lot better, in fact, than what you see on SSA ICG, where you see the polyps and the BVM actually structurally standing out beautifully. Uh, SDO CDA is also able to uncover CNG where you have an elevated type 2 MNV and you can pick up the CNG complex. Now, this is a very interesting article which also came out by uh, Henry Sparks et al., who looked at monitoring AMD activity. They used OCTA to develop a mathematical model. Okay, and they used the vascular parameters A, CNV, area of CNV, total length of all CNG vessels, overall number of vascular segments, and fractal dimensions. And they used this to create a mathematical hologram, which you see on the upper panel, upper part of the panel, at, in this one particular case where, for example, you see a cyclic regression and recurrence. And what they did is in this hologram, they looked at, they were able to pick out those early neovascular sprouts, and they correlated that those sprouts emerging and regressing, and it correlated beautifully with the cyclic recurrence and regression pattern. So we will hear more of this as, as work is being done on these mathematical modules. But as of now, one of the marquee and recognized uses of Octa in AMD is this uh, subclinical neovascularization in non-exudative AMD with beautiful study brought by Dias et al. Uh, from Dr. Phil Rosenfeld's group where they looked at 160 eyes, 110 in integrated AMD 50 GA, and they found that 23 of these 160 or 14.4% had high incidence of the subclinical CMD. And 10 out of these 13 uh, eyes had prior detected subclinical CMM on the sweats of Octa. And so basically, eyes with subclinical CMM going on to clinical CMM were 21%. Whereas eyes without subclinical CNV going on to subclinical CNV only 3.6%. That gave, uh, you know, a very high uh, prediction value. About after detection of subclinical value, the risk of clinical CNV is 15.2 times more than eyes that didn't have uh, the subclinical CNV. So this is another example from that uh, series where you have uh, structural loosely at one and two different levels. And you see that there's this intermediate AMD sitting quietly there, quiescent, asymptomatic. But below that, you, below the RP, you see this creepy crawly neovascular subclinical uh, network growing continuously, four months, 14 months, up to 21 months, and then suddenly at two months, we do not know what the trigger is. That, that, that's the issue here. We do not know what the trigger is, but suddenly out of the blue, some fluid starts appearing, patient is still asymptomatic, antibodies are suggested, did not go ahead, and then a month later, you see it suddenly explodes, and then the patient becomes symptomatic, is given uh, antibodies as looked for the treatment. So there are limitations of octa which we recognize, large PDs, subretinal macular hemorrhage, severe pigmentation, severe scarring and clouds, all this will obfuscate the picture and limit the use of Okta. So in summary, Okta's utility is definitely going to be there and going to keep exploding and increasing in AMD with advances in Okta. Uh, Dye-based angiography may no longer be needed for neovascular AMD. For predictive value, detecting subclinical CMD, as I mentioned, in non-neovascular AMD, tailoring follow-up, you know, once you see that network there, you can, you know, make the patient come more frequently. It can predict early strikes for subclinical MNV. Once we detect these predictors a little better, uh, early predictors for exudative activity, like I mentioned, tiny branching and vascular loose, differentiating the types of MNV as I've shown, and staging or characterizing uh, RAP lesions, it can give us an early sighter, an early detection of uh, uh, this recurrent network. And SSOCT is going to play a greater role in detecting type 1 MNV and T3 specifically. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anand, for that um, uh, lucid talk. Um, any, qu any queries? We'll take a few questions now. Uh, Anand, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think that um, OCT angiography can actually replace uh, conventional angiography in, uh, in PCV? Like I'm giving you a situation, PCV. Yeah, so I think so. What has been shown is that with the newer developments in uh, swept source OCT, basically, if you have to do that, you have to hone in, zoom in on that RP choriocapillary slab. And I, uh, everybody believes that the choriocapillary is going to be the next big thing in you know, uh, macular imaging. And uh, swept source OCT is doing a great job. What I showed you were images which 100,000 A scans per second. Now, Plexilead is coming out, and more other companies are also coming out with faster machines with better noise removal, projection artifact removal, and as I showed you, those networks are actually seeing better. So if the media is reasonably uh, clear, it'll probably be, it'll probably, you know, encroach in that territory, and we might see uh, greater ubiquitous use of uh, Okta for PCV also. But it'll have to be, I guess, with swept source OCT rather than OCT. 
Now, how good is uh, Octa for detection of polyps? That's uh, because uh, BVNs, I understand it's, it's, it's good enough. Yes. But um, for detection of polyps, it's yeah. not Octa poor in um, picking a polyp. Yes, as of now, no, as of now, because one thing is this Flex Elite is not universally available. All those images were only exclusively Flex Elite images where you have that depth, uh, you know, uh, it, it images at that uh, deep depth. So that is very critical. Also, we have to remember that unlike BVN, which is largely uniplanar, polyps are multiplanar. So it has to be able to uh, detect and segment at that different level. But uh, the new Plex Elite versions are coming out to 200,000 waveforms. So there it is becoming even more easier to pick out these uh, multiplanar uh, things at that depth. So yes, the answer is futurist going forward, possibly, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, the next talk. Uh, Dr. Unnikrishnan Nair will be speaking on NFAS imaging, um, an underused and underrecognized uh, entity. Um, so, just uh, before this, I'd like you to just uh, spend a couple of seconds looking at this image and uh, can you spot the odd man out in this? So, uh, it's quite interesting to know that uh, this is the thing. What does FAICG, autofluorescence infrared, blue reflectors have in common that OCT doesn't? And the answer is the top end view. You, it gives you an overview, a perspective of the whole disease at a go, detail, and uh, the characterization of the lesion in its entirety. So this is a good example I have. This is what the OCT does. It gives you a slice of a slice and a cross-sectional view, but it doesn't give you the whole picture uh, when you want to see a pathology in its entirety. So obtaining the better, uh, the multimodal imaging has many modalities. Uh, some do the me metabolic imaging of the RP. Some of them give you the vascularity. Some of them give you uh, circulatory changes. But the main, the OCD gives you topographic, tomographic evidence. But if you could apply the tomographic evidence uh, on the end-on view, that is what NFAS means. And as of now, I think it's underutilized, underrecognized. It's going to get bigger and better. Why? Because it overcomes two main issues of Okta. That is the price. NFAS is hidden in all your machines, but you just don't know where it is. And two, it, it, uh, a lot of the uh, artifacts, the projection artifacts of the Okta are resolved in the NFAS, actually. It's an old thing that happened. For people first started thinking about it in 1997, but only when the machines got faster and you could track the retina, true tracking, could you actually do repetitive scans and get depth-resolved images of different coronal planes. So the, uh, w the NFAS is just a reconstruction of your B-scan images. It takes many, many points, A-scans, converts them to a B-scan image, and then it does it in the coronal plane to give you, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, the uh, NFAS image. So it's about obtaining the big, big picture. You can do quantifications. At, there's a shift to tridimensionality. I'll explain what that is, and all these things will explain. So the first thing it gives you is cohesion. When you see a single slice of OCT, and you see multiple slices, you've got to imagine what the lesion looks like on, a, on, on the NFAS, how much is the fluid, how long, large it is. But you can see, this is a multicolor image. You can see what this does to you. In this image itself, you can see an elevation, fluid, a spot over there. This is what I mean by the cohesive, cohesive appearance. That is the, end, the top view to give you the whole pathology. And this is something what the NFAS does. It tells you the entire picture. It tells you where the PED is. It tells you where the layers, uh, some of the other retinal layers. So this is what you call by the overview. So besides being a cohesive view, the next important word I'd like to mention is the shift. What does a shift mean? The shift is a, the shift to tridimensional viewing. That is not three. It's not 3D or stereoscope. We're talking about tridimensional. That is involving the Z offset. That is being able to go up and down in the picture, being able to look at the outer plexiform, the outer nuclear, the the RP slab, the, being able to uh, use the Z offset to learn about the pathology faster. And why is that important? Because every pathology in the retina is related to another pathology in the retina or a pathology in the choroid. I'll just give you an example of this. This is a wonderful image. This is a uh, NFAS image of something happening in the deeper layers beneath the brooks. You can see a chorea capillary, uh, something happening. And when you go, you can relate the PED or the Rusnoid PED to that particular lesion over there. If you take a simple example of a CSR, this is what happens. Here you can see dilated choroidal vessels. At a point, you can see a chorea capillary loss. And over that, you see the PEDs. So this is what a depth resolved NFAS imaging can do to your uh, uh, clinical understanding. Uh, when we talk about segmentation, it, it all uh, matters where you take the segmentation lines from. 
this is a case of a PCV. You take it through the RP, uh, the RP slab, you get a wrinkling on the surface, which is a characteristic defined lesion. And when you go deep in a straight planar line, you get the choroidal uh, dilated vessels in a different plane. But the key is to find the ideal concavity. What do you mean by the ideal concavity? If you want to do study the choroid, you need an RP fit. If you want to study a vitreoretinal pathology, you need an ILM fit. So that is what you look here. So to study anything on the surface, you need something that goes parallel to or nearly parallel to the top surface. If you want to study uh, the pathology we need, you need something that is parallel to the retinal pigment epithelium. So any artifact can destroy your NFAS, whether it be for NFAS for opta or NFAS structural. So I'd like to just take you to uh, some of the clinical lesions. Just looking at a macular hole, how interesting is this? Obviously, you know a macular hole, but this is an amazing picture of cystoid changes that go around. Probably it will tell you the cystoid macular edema changes that go around a macular hole in different planar levels. This is uh, one going through the outer plexiform, and this is something going slightly higher up where the changes are less. Diabetic macular edema, an image, a top view image of how the cysts are. Why is it important now? The, there is different prognosis for cysts that happen in the outer plexiform, cysts that happen in different layers. Uh, so having uh, an NFAS through the different layers is absolutely valuable to, uh, for a, in a prognostic sense nowadays. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, not through the cyst. This is a deeper level where you can actually see the areas where there is loss of the ellipsoid zone here. So prognosticating, you have outer retinal prognostication, mid retinal prognostication. Uh, hard exudates. See, this is a wonderful pattern that uh, shows you hard exudates in this particular layer. So that, that gives you a, a to, uh, an idea about the pathology happening there. This is another picture you, which goes down, and you can see there's a lot of dropouts, but this is a warning sign. You could think of this as chorea capillary dropouts or ischemic events, but if you look at it, these are all transfusion shadowing defects that produce an artifactual loss of the images from the chorea capillary layer. Diabetic TIDs, you can wonderfully make out the origin starting, how they, uh, how they progress over the surface of the retina, though this is very difficult because you get a lot of segmentation errors when you look at uh, pathology on top of the retina. MACTEL, it's a brilliant technology for MACTEL. Here you see uh, uh, the, nothing much on the octa, but here you see a well-defined lesion, uh, pigmentary area, cavitations, lamella, defects, all in one scan. This is quite interesting. There are papers that actually say that you can make out the edge of the progression of MACTEL by using NFAS scanning, all the damage that happens. Well, here you see it's a very well-defined edge. Uh, uh, here you see a slightly smudged edge. The lamella defect, knowing that the lamella defect looks like this and it is more towards the temporal side than the nasal side is something that you cannot get from a, a, a tomographic scan. This is uh, wh where the NFAS scan scores over uh, many of the uh, modalities in MACTEL. In a, this is a patient who has, you see some changes here, you're not very sure what those changes are, but on, this is, this is not an octa, this is a plain and simple NFAS scan where you can actually make out the, 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 structural, uh, the structure of the CNVM over here. And you can see that very clearly in the subsequent scans. And th these are a few other examples where you see a non-proliferative one with a change in the pathology. This happens because the layers kind of dip in octal, uh, on, in MACTEL, and that's why you see these lesions here. That's a, a CNVM, which actually you see the structural change over there. And here you see, you can imagine the outline of the vessels. This is structural OCT and this is octa. So you can make out nearly as information from the structural NFAS as you can from the octa. Dry AMD, you can see a lot of changes here, chorea capillary loss, wrinkling, and then actually the, this is through the tips of the drusen. So different levels give different amount of in information about the amount of drusen and the amount of underlying changes. Geographic atrophy, brilliant images you can see over here. You can see in geogra geographic area, there is a scrolling of the surface of the, uh, of the ELM sometimes that happens, which translates to outer retinal tubulations. And uh, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, you see these on cross-section, but this is the entire extent where the ELM is actually scrolled in the area of geographic atrophy. Another picture. So again, in, uh, uh, I'm just going to quiz in CNVMs, or they're called QMNVs or uh, uh, non-exudated CNVMs. You see an elevation over here. In the next picture, what you see is that there's a small vascularity on the octa. So, octa is the modality for diagnosing quizzen CNVMs, but 
you can show these are some of the other images you have where you can see prison CMVMs. But I'd like to show you this single picture over here where you see a little bit of fluid. And here you see the fluid between the two smart PEDs in a patient with uh, a quiescent uh, macular neovascular membrane. You can detect occult membranes like this. This is an occult mem membrane. You can see all the vascularity and the vessels on a plain and simple and fast OCT. This is not an octa. Uh, this is another image of a type 1 membrane where you see this is through the membrane. You see the wrinkling, and this is a shrem. This is the subarachnoid hyperrefractive material, the whole extent, which is uh, in the amount of SRF. Uh, an octa, but an octa shows you the pure blood vessels, but you can s actually see the fibrovascular complex. You can see it pretty well on the NFAS OCT. Pachycoroid diseases, you they can be sectoral uh, pachycoroid dilatation, diffuse and generalized dilatation. You can see directional lesion vessels using uh, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, structural impasse. I'm just going to, I'm just going to need uh, one more minute, please. Uh, PCV, it is not that great, but here you could, this is a typically described showing a wrinkling of the RP fit. With underlying, you can see the pachycoroid disease. You can actually make out small, this is structural OCT again, I'm stressing, you can make out the small polypoidal lesions when you just go underneath the, uh, the RP over there. This is a case of pachycoroid uh, peripapillary pachycoroid syndrome. When you go underneath, you can see the dilated choroidal vascularity in a deeper layer. You can see the dilated choroidal vessels. And here you can see, this is through the, uh, the double layer sign, you can see the pro proliferated CMV around the disc over there. In CSR, a lot of lesions, you can see a lot of uh, points, you can see dilated choroidal vessels over here, but you can see the fits of the, uh, the PEDs, different lesions. Here you see a vascular loop. Uh, I can't explain that actually. So you, uh, a lot of choroidal uh, dilatation. So I'm just going through this. Interesting point, in fast you see the causative PD just by the side of the SRF over here. Uh, a lot of uh, subretinal precipitates in the fluid over there. Uh, this is through the PD, but when you take something through the RP, you can see the entirety of the RP defects in this particular patient with uh, CSR. Another CSR where you see the dimpling of the neurosensory retina into the CSR pocket. Here looks like a tree trunk over here. And where what you see here is some of the layers are actually thickened over, over there in the area around the SRF. So uh, another picture you think it looks like CSR. You did an NFAS, you found CME around it. So the diagnosis was modified to an adult vitreliform degeneration with resorption inside. So I'm just going to skip all these and um, uh, I'm just going to conclude saying that there are a lot of beautiful information that you get from a plain and fast structural OCT. One, point number one, you, have, you need time to look at it. Point number two, you've got to find out which button in the machine actually tells you this is an NFAST scan because most of us don't look at it. And point number three, you could consider it as a cheaper surrogate for Okta in the future. Thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Omni, for that, uh, that very difficult talk. Uh, any, uh, any questions? We can take a few questions. Um, uh, Omni, I have one question for you. I mean, uh, can, we, uh, can we do this in all machines? That's my question number one. And then uh, when you, ca can you, uh, in, in when you uh, have to get an NFAS image, do you have to actually modify the way in which you uh, do your OCT scan? Yeah. So. Uh, when we have been, we use a spectralis, and the spectralis, you have to have a particular line density to convert it to an NFAS scan. You need at least 61 lines for the, in, the, in a raster. Anything more than 61 lines, uh, uh, you can do a uh, NFAS scanning. Uh, the advanced scanning protocol in the Zeiss machines allow you to do a, the, the NFAS. Uh, I haven't used many of the other machines, but these are the, I, I'm very sure that these two mo uh, machines have it. Uh, you, uh, you have to modify your scan in this way and you have there are certain ways you have to modify the way you take a scan it is always preferable to have your pathology horizontal in the scan okay so if you take a scan in which your rp base fit is uh, way offline it's it's slanting you won't be able to do the segmentation and if you can do the segmentation you cannot uh, talk about uh, the layers and depth resolution and all those things because I remember one of the photographs that you showed on CSR with, uh, you know, this layer, surrounding layer, the tree trunk uh, appearance that you said. 
you, uh, you, you know, did mention that the layer was thicken, and that could be because of the segmentation. Because that you had, you had, it was more the slope yeah. of the cut, and that's probably why you know you had that uh, more yeah. thicker. But in the structural OCT, the, the layer was thickened. That could be due to a directional OCT uh, artifact also. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, now I just one more time. Uh, when you do the manual segmentation, uh, you actually sit and draw yourself the lines, or how, how do you see the manual that? segmentation? Is uh, it is actually a corrective thing uh, in the spectralis? When you take a manual seg segmentation and you do you correct three scans, the machine sometimes does the rest for you. But uh, it is always better to get the scanning right than sit and correct the uh, manual segmentation. Thank you, Dr. Uni. We'll go on to the next uh, topic. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Darais to, to speak on uh, OCTA. <laughs> the new so diagnostic modality in dot, dot, dot. So I thank Dr. Uni for this opportunity. And thank you for those blanks. So now I can just speak about whatever I feel like. Basically, I would be talking about things which haven't been covered in uh, like non-AMD uh, areas where, specifically where I found Okta to be invaluable and really, really useful for managing my patients. So the outline of my talk is we'll start with macular pathology, we'll go deeper, we'll see what has never been seen, then we'll go wider and we'll see what has never been seen without a dye in the past, and these are the two areas I'd like to cover. So here you can see basically this is again anatomy and the retinal capillary system in the macular area is consisting of the superficial intermediate and the deep. And what's very interesting is it's only the superficial which is seen with fluorescein angiography. The other two plexes are invisible with FFA. I think we are very hungry this morning. So this is the second cake to come up in the session after Dr. Uni's cake, chocolate cake. So we have a vanilla cake here. So if you just look at the, uh, the, the, in fact, I'm going to say opposite of what Dr. Uni said. If you just look at the cake, it looks like it's a plain white vanilla cake. But look at the colorful layers within. And this is what Okta is going to help us do. Layer by layer, we're going to go segment and see what lies within. My first case is a patient who's been challenging me since 2012, eight, uh, for the uh, last eight years. He's a retired brigadier. Came for a routine checkup, non-diabetic or hypertensive. He has a history of porphyria. And left eye, he says the vision has been poor for four years. He, uh, he is known to have had CSR in the past, vision 618. He is not interested in any further treatment. So we said, okay, uh, you can come for after six months. And lo and behold, again, he's come after three years in 2015. And please see the blue colored arrows which are there on both sides. Look at the SRF which has come up in this patient in both the eyes. Vision in left eye has dropped a little bit. And you see little pockets of fluid. Yeah. So just to make it simpler, 2012 is below and 2015 is top and you can see the fluid coming up. And look at the interesting configuration of the RP also, the irregular PED. Unfortunately, we, we did not have Heidelberg at that time, so we, have, we just have the flash imaging, the FFA and the ICG. And we could kind of imagine some fuzzy small CNVM in this eye and we gave three anti-VEGF injections at monthly intervals. Patient is not happy, just this is after anti-VEGF, the fluid is just not going away. So now we are worried about our diagnosis. Is, is, uh, are we diagnosing it correctly? Is there any component of CNV in this patient or not? And this is where the initial octa came in and rescued us. So now on the octa, we can see these vascular loops in the right and the left eye. Also, we went deeper with swept source imaging and found how thick the choroid was, 500 microns in this patient. We saw, we did a wide field autofluorescence and we could see the vascular tracks confirming the kind of combination this patient was suffering from, CSR, CNVM. So that time, aflibercept was introduced and lo and behold, you can just see, I've just put one scan because we don't have time to sh show you all, but one aflibercept and you can see how beautifully the edema is resolved in the upper scans on both the sides. And now, of course, we have swept source octa and you can see the beautifully the capillary loops in both the eyes and now this patient has to have a flibercept every three to four months, and I'm titrating his treatment based, of course, on cystoid changes, SRF, but also on the vascular network at times. So the learning points from this case is uh, there can be a type one CNVM lurking in the case with sick RP in pachychoroid. 
PDT would be ideal for such a patient, but because he has porphyria, it can be fatal, so I'm not, I don't have the guts to do PDT in this patient. And Okta cleared the doubts about the presence of CNVM, and it justifies using an expensive treatment in this patient. Let's move on. PAM has already been discussed right now, just before me, and you can see the beautiful PAM lesion in the structural OCT. But I want to concentrate on the center figure in the middle, and you can see how the superficial layer is fine but you can see how affected the deep layer is in, in, this, in the octa, and this is seen only on octa. Uh, next, we will talk a little bit about best vitelliform. I would like to run the video. So you can just please look at the upper part, the upper video in the black, and you can see slowly. So sometimes vitelliform just gives a kind of hyperfluorescence on FFA. You don't know whether the CNVM is there or not, but keep looking at that image. See how beautifully the network lights up. And there's no doubt that this patient needs therapy. You know, there's no doubt that at hyperfluorescence, the fuzziness which you see on convention, it is something which is lying beneath which you need to treat. Unnecessarily, we should not be giving these patients anti-VEGF, but this is one case which does require anti-VEGF and does well with it. MACTEL, I think, has been extensively discussed this morning. So now, uh, just a quick word. This is the, uh, the uh, gas and Brody classical uh, uh, teaching, the classification. There's a more detailed and a very busy slide showing the latest OCTA classification, but basically it starts off with a normal uh, network where we only see telangiectasia in the temporal part of the fovea in the deep plexus, and it goes on to the stages which have CNV. So here, this is one of our patients. So you can see, basically it looks normal in the superficial, but here you see telangiectasia seen on the temporal part in the deep plexus. As you go more, uh, more uh, towards the complex cases, you see some telling tactics in the deep in on all around the fovea. And as you, uh, it goes to grade three, it starts, the pigment accumulates and shows vascular invasion. And most important is grade four, or uh, the, the one with the CNBM. And of course, in this, it's very important to see the avascular segment where, and this is where scrolling the scan is important because only when you scroll the scan, you'll be able to actually delineate that you have a network in a place it shouldn't be. And this is the only stage which would require therapy. So now that we have gone deeper, let's move on. Let's talk about how we use it for wild, wide field imaging. So it's excellent to use Octa for patients, of course, with deranged kidney function. But even if the kidney function is not deranged, it is nice to use it as a non-invasive uh, modality, which we can repeat it again and again. We don't want to keep on injecting our patients with dye. So with a high resolution wide field imaging, we are able to get scans up to, with a swept source up to 22 into 22 millimeters. And these are some of our patients. So this is the conventional imaging. You can see a proliferative, it's a spotter, diabetic retinopathy. And see how beautifully you can see the network, the peripheral capillary non-perfusion with the white, the, the montage on the, uh, on the uh, octa, which is done with swept source imaging. Let us see whether we can titrate our therapy also according to this. So this was a case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see the beautiful NVE. And the first two, if you really, uh, these two are octa, and the third is conventional angiography. And post laser, you can see how the leakage is gone and how the network has vanished in the figure below. And this is a st corresponding structural OCT below. And what I would like to bring out is, uh, this was something we published as a photo essay in IGO, but you can see how nicely the flow, the red dots are there pre-laser and pre, uh, the FPP has shrunken, become thinner and shriveled up, so to say, post-therapy. Again, NVE regressing. So this is a patient with a, a neovascularization just nasal to the optic disc and this is a color photo and this is of course not angio, this is an octa. And you can see three days after anti vegf how it's resolved beautifully. And although the thick vessels remain, most of the thin uh, networks are gone after anti vegf So to conclude, whenever we see Octa, it's it looks very impressive and beautiful, but there are some tips for interpreting it. Otherwise, we're going to uh, make a lot of mistakes and we're going to see a lot of things which are not actually there. So just firstly, please analyze layer by layer. So that's very important. Secondly, correlate it to the beef scan with the unfast un un scans, because if we just see it in isolation, we're going to make mistakes. And third is analyzing the video can help, the, uh, uh, because sometimes if you just get a printout from your optometrist or the person who's sending it, you can miss a lot of stuff. So you have to see the video or do the scrolling yourself. So this takes time. 
So what we always say is FFA, you say it takes five to 10 minutes or whatever, and, but interpreting, now we are used to it, we can interpret in a few seconds. But with Okta, it's the other way around. The scan takes a few seconds, but we take several minutes to kind of interpret it. So I think that's a challenge in a busy OPD. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Doris. I mean, uh, just, a, just to start off the discussion, um, where would you, which all clinical scenarios would you say, this is the only modality I need? So I, I don't think, I, of course I'm a, as I think Dr. Storinghe always says, proponent of multimodal imaging. So I think multimodal is, is important. But uh, I would say that, for example, in a case of BEST, for example, BEST with a if you are suspecting a CNV, I'm not suing it. I think so certain cases like that, I think it really has helped us. And also, many of these type 1 CNVMs in cases of CSR, the elderly patients with CSR. So these are two things where I find it very, very useful. And uh, how, how do you uh, use it in myopic uh, CNVMs? <laughs> so that's very interesting because I think the next session here, I'm going to be presenting exactly what you asked in uh, Dr. Anirudh Agarwal's session. So basically in myopic CNVMs, uh, the clue, uh, you can, I, I would r really be uh, scared to make a diagnosis only on Okta or this thing, basically because you can definitely miss it. So I think FFA still has a role in myopic CNVM, but the way the, uh, I mean Okta is useful and also the structural OCT, what I like to see is if the, the fuzziness and the thickness of the retina overlying that CNVM. So these are clues about how the membrane is responding. So are you interested in the response to therapy or the diagnosis? What, were you, what was your question in your mind? Both. Both. <laughs> so I think initially for maybe what we do is for the initial diagnosis, we do multimodal imaging. But for response to therapy, then you can rely on the non-invasive. Thank you. Do we have any questions, please? OK, thank you, Darius. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, our last speaker, Dr. Ashish, who is going to talk to us about the burning topic in retinal imaging, uh, that is uh, choroidal circulation, choroidal imaging, choroidal capillary imaging. Thank you, Dr. Unni, for yet again giving me the opportunity to be a part of this discussion once again. So pretty much, you know, there's uh, a slight touch from all, all the speakers towards the choroid that we heard in the morning. These are my disclosures. So we are all aware that how important the choroid is because the kind of nutrition is provided to the outer layers. And till now, at, as we were discussing about the OCT, till now it's still pretty much ICG is the gold standard in many cases because that is the one which gives you the perfusion analysis. And OCT is still evolving. And although there are some practical problems with ICG because of its availability, which is not there everywhere, and at the end of the day, it is an invasive investigation. So since the OCD started, and then when the first time Dr. Spade, he came with the concept that you can image choroid easily in a normal spectral domain OCT with a slight uh, shifting the zero delay line, which is nothing but just you shift your lens towards the patient and then take the inverted image. But now with the help of EDI softwares, you can image in all these spectral domain OCD machines. The problem with this was that you were not actually seeing much details on the vitreous side. You were seeing a lot of details here. So over the time, as uh, previous speakers mentioned that with the, have a, with the better wavelength, you can image both the sides much clearer and the wider. So the million dollar question is whether imaging of the choroid is really useful. The reason I am asking this question is, just look at this normal choroidal thickness. It starts from 191 up to 354. Look at the variability. The variability is approximately 160 micron. And if you look at in the central macula also, there are different, different pockets. Each has a different, different thickness. And even that the same with the optic disc. Choroidal thickness varies with the age, with the each decade, the coral thickness thins out. With each diopter, it thins out. Even it changes within the day. On top of that, you know, when you look at this coral thickness, the inner boundary is easy. You have a clear interface. But outer boundary is a problem because that's where sometimes you cannot really make out that from where it should be measured. 
So having such a dynamic and such a variable structure, do you really think that you know, it helps you? The answer surprisingly is yes. Because you are not going to you know, take decisions just on the basis of few microns. You are going to take decisions on the basis of the structure and the overall thickness of the choroid. So I'm going to talk about in next few slides the machine that probably in the hall everybody would have, a spectral domain OCT, and how it helps you in taking a lot of clinical decisions in terms of the diagnosis and the treatment. For example, if you wouldn't have the spectral domain OCT, there was a time that these kind of images, you, you would have just mentioned or labeled that RP changes, or probably a geographic atrophy. But if you look at the image, just a normal spectral domain OCT image, choroid is absolutely thinned out. But RP is good. Photoreceptor layer is good. So that's how you differentiate geographic atrophy where you have even the RP is also completely thinned out. So you have a prognostic point to make here that this is a case where I can give a better prognosis compared to the geographic atrophy. So this was again a modality Again, coined by Spade as an age-related choroidal atrophy. Another case, you must be seeing a lot of myopes. A lot of myopes, you see this kind of elevation, which we call as a dome-shaped macula. Dome-shaped macula, again, the reason is just within that staphylomatous area, you have a slight convex area. Below that, you have a choroidal thickness. And sometimes you see this kind of NSD, not essential to treat, because there is no pathology here. Probably. That's where a little bit octa is helping us in case to just identify subtle NVs, CNV if you have. That is the only case when you treat these cases. So again, important in decision making with just the spectral domain OCT. Now this is, everybody is seeing these cases in your day-to-day -day clinical practice, how it helps and how it has immensely changed our understanding that how you should be, be treating these cases. For example, on the left side, you look at this case. Case treated, you had a, a leakage in FFA, you treated it, and then everything is resolved anteriorly. But look at the coral thickness. Coral thickness remains the same. However, on the right side, if you see, again, you treated this patient in a different way with the PDT. Coral thickness changed. So that's where coral imaging has helped us to understand that probably PDT is a met much better choice in treating these cases. Again, this is the you know, disease which is quite close to my heart, where again, coral imaging helps you, just a spectral domain OCT helps you a lot. Why? For example, if you just look at this case, case present in the, in the beginning, you can't even make out the posterior boundary because it's too thick. So you cannot, so coral is too thick, and you can see a lot of HRS, you know, which is a predictor like, which is a sign of hyperreflectivity, a sign of inflammation in both right and the left eye. Once you give three doses of the pulse therapy, you can measure the choroid now. But on the other side also, you can measure the choroid now, posterior boundary comes in. But now, look at the three weeks after the steroid therapy. Left eye already has a quite anterior recurrence. But I'm not, you know, I'm, this, is, this is not the one which we should learn from. But the, basically, just look at the C, concentrate on this. Again, after seeing the good posterior boundary, you are not seeing the posterior boundary now. So this is the time when, again, coronal imaging helps you, you step up your therapy, which before the anterior recurrence comes in. Because anterior recurrence is the one which is going to deteriorate the visual acuity over the time. So that's where the normal spectral domain coronal imaging helps you. Now, these cases we all are seeing day in and day out. This is the pay, case, case which came to me day before yesterday, just for an opinion before cataract surgery. Just look at the central fovea. This slide I have just put up, you know, if some of you, if you know, you have not really familiar in a normal spectral domain OCT pachychoroid, just to differentiate. Look at this normal picture of the right eye. Look at the coral vessels, absolutely fine, no problems. Left eye, very subtle, some RP changes if you see. You know, we were ma labeling all these RP changes just like RP changes before. We didn't have the choroidal imaging. But if you see the choroid in a normal single uh, line scan, these are big vessels lining here. And the entire choreo capillaries is completely compressed. So that's where you know, you make a decision that I'm going to follow up these patients even more regularly compared to the other patients. Again. Another patient, look at this, very subtle 
RP changes. And once you track this along with the line scan, just till here, everything is all right. Corio capillaries are all right. But if you just come here, big coral vessels compressing the corio capillaries completely. So as everybody, I think, has touched upon the importance of the pachychoroid, pachychoroid is the one, you know, which is being helped by coral imaging immensely, and you do not need sophisticated instruments, even, you know, normal spectral domain OCT, you can very well do it. Now, AMD, it's not really, you know, uh, the tool that we are currently using in day-to-day -day making some decisions in terms of the treatment, but for example, as uh, I think Shroff also said, that there are some cases which OCT actually is a better tool if you really want to see, but there are some uh, times when you have a fundus photography appearance which confuses you. That, you know, probably whether we are, I am dealing with an AMD or I am dealing with some kind of vitelliform dystrophy. So in all the AMDs, you see predominantly thinning of the choroid, while in the dystrophy, you see the thickness of the choroid. But probably, you know, an OCTA is a better tool right here. There are some other areas which we do not use them, a choroidal imaging, as a clinical decision-making tool as of now, maybe in future, for example, in diabetic retinopathy, because we do not have the real uh, evidences yet in terms of the choroidal imaging. Diabetic retinopathy, retinal dystrophy, choroidal vascularity index, choroidal volume, and choroidal vascular thickness analysis. So choroidal is a wonderful tool, even with the normal spectral domain OCT, I think, which everybody must be having if they have the retina practice. Thank you. Can you just uh, just enlighten us something about the choroidal vascularity index that you've just mentioned? Something just basic about that. Yeah, so choroidal vascularity index basically means uh, you you go further back, and there are some methods, for example, like binarization method. You can have the volumetric analysis, and then you can have the low, uh, smaller vessels and the larger vessel, the ratio of them so that uh, you can predict, okay, probably, you know, the larger vessels and the lower uh, other vessels are uh, compressed. So probably means this is an analysis which you can do better with this, probably the swept source machines. And as of now, practically, I have never used them. So probably if somebody has used them, they, have, they can give a better insight on that. Darius, anything? Uh like a, uh, the stroma versus the yeah. uh, vascularity, the ratio which they're seeing, and uh, doing, for, I think Dr. Rupesh has done a lot of work on that. And I think the pattern is very, very fascinating. For example, I, when I, we are seeing our own, uh, I think in the beginning, one of the speakers showed peripapri pachychoroid. So then you get a totally different kind of, so, so when you trace the choroid near the optic disc, it's really thick, and then you go towards the macula, it becomes thin. And all other eyes, it's just the inverse. So I think there's a lot to be learned from this yeah. and from imaging. But uh, uh, as you said, there's been a shift towards uh, the ratio between the vascularity to stroma to now uh, choriocapillary density index and a choriocapillary vascularity index is now becoming more and more uh, relevant yeah. Uh, yeah. these days. The correlation of these two uh, regression and recurrence of CNVM yes. Yes. Um, yes. is being studied nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions? Uh, we have, we've just uh, finished way uh, a bit early. We've got 10 minutes for any discussion or questions, if you have any. Only are you doing uh, stereo angiography by using the Heidelberg system? Because we had a discussion on this in DRF, because Dr. In, I think in Singapore, the groups are using it a lot. Yeah. And uh, we're not doing it. We're, we're not doing it. Uh, uh, the obvious reason being, uh, the, the volume of patients you have and the amount of uh, time it takes to take stereoscopic pairs. Yeah. So um, I think that was a part of the Everest, uh, yes. the Everest yeah. uh, diagnostic criteria, the stereoscopic yeah, yeah, images. Yeah. Not only anybody using choroidal volume. Anybody measuring choroidal volumes? Uh, it's not standardized. We've tried a bit of image J modification. Uh, we, we've done a bit of uh, study on the image J modification, getting the volumes, but it doesn't. Uh, is there? Is there means? Did you correlate it with the real uh, SF, uh, you know, subfoveal thickness? Does it really correlate? No, see, uh, we have a study on subfoveal uh, thickness, but we haven't done anything uh, on the choroidal volumes. We've yes. tried measuring it, but it's too. 
So it's still doing, uh, but the MHJ variability is pretty high. Yeah. Thank you. I had a question for Dr. Darius. Any uh, tips that you have uh, to avoid artifacts while uh, capturing an OCTA image? And uh, especially in those cases who have a bilateral poor visual activity, it's pretty difficult to get a good image because they can't focus for about a few seconds. So any tips in that? I think that's one of the limitations of the technology probably because we can't do anything about that. Oh, I think with faster sc uh, scanning speed, that will be this case. I think that's the only thing. There are some modifications that are now out. Uh, one is that reducing the raster to just the area of interest. And I think there is a proprietary scan from uh, Spectralis that is coming. It was called Dense B Scan. I think it is coming out under some other name now, where you can take a really small scan only at the pathology. And what that does is that it makes sure that you have a high uh, resolution. It is done faster. A l very dense scans in a very small area. Uh, can, can you elaborate on how does PDT shrinks the choroid? You said PDT is a better modality of treatment for these conditions. Now I just want to I start thinking about it that how does PDT is going to go through all these RP layers and shrink the choroid vessels? Yes, absolutely. How, how does it do, do it? I mean, I haven't seen many references to this. So, uh, so, so uh, as you said, you know, the way uh, the PDT works is on the wavelength and the kind of dye that you inject and everything is uh, absorbed by the coronal vasculature. So, the, so basically the entire laser works on the area where the dye is being absorbed. Okay. In the, in the, so those are the dilated vessels, in, especially in the pachychoroid cases, where entire dye goes in and the laser works, especially in that area. And once laser works in that area, then the shrinking comes in. Okay. I mean, I just wanted references for we this. We may not be very sure how it works in I, the I, I, I But probably, you know, it's, it's yeah. really difficult yeah. to understand. So the principle if it works, then probably PDT can be revived into a very big way. This. No, but because uh, pachychoroid, gradually we are seeing so many patients, yeah. we don't know what to do with them. I mean, so even a, RP, a lot of uh, RP focal detachments, we see cases where uh, with choroidal thickening, choroidal CVI, and so uh, if that works. So probably, sir, because of that understanding, we are s uh, treating more and more CSR ca cases with the PDT. Sure, yeah. that's true. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashish. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, everybody for uh, coming and attending our uh, in instruction course. and. Uh, I'd like to end with an invitation for, uh, if you like what you saw here, we have a Retina Imaging Congress, a Jute con Congress happening in Trivandrum on the 5th and 6th of June. Uh, we are lucky to have 50 national faculty who are very keen on imaging. And this time we have uh, some very heavy international faculty. Dr. Quirkus is coming to our meeting. Uh, Dr. Marion Monk, who's the head of the Bern uh, Reading Center. Dr. Adrian Funk from Australia, Dr. Jay Chablani. Uh, who is currently in Pittsburgh, USA. So we're going to have a very interactive case. Uh, and Dr. Shobha Shiva Prasad from Moorfields, uh, London. So we're going to have a very case-oriented retinal imaging congress, two days of just pure retinal imaging. Uh, I'd like to extend my personal invitation to all of you too. Thank you. <laughs>